Now, this is the revelation of God's will for the church of all generations, but particularly in this hour. This is an hour where the Lord is is desiring and is going to release us again beyond anything we've ever seen in the book of Acts. But read the book of Acts as a state as a revelation of what God intends to do with his church in this hour. It's more than a history lesson. It's a vision statement from 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 God's heart to to this generation. Verse 11, now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Acts chapter 19, verse 11. God worked extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that were brought from his body to the sick, when when they were brought from his body to the sick, the diseases left and evil spirits went out of the sick people. Paul prayed for handkerchiefs. They laid the handkerchiefs on the sick people. Demons came out of those sick people. We heard the testimony tonight of, of the laying of the hands on, on a picture of a sick lady in that very hour she was healed in a, in a dramatic way in the hospital. It's the same kind of thing going on. Now, uh, verse 13, there were some itinerant Jewish exorcists who took, a, took it upon themselves to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus over those that had evil spirits. They'd seen Paul do it, and they said, hey, he's doing it. Why don't we do it? They said, we exercise you by the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who were doing this. These seven brothers, they watched Paul do it. They preached Jesus, the, the, the uh, Jesus of Paul is, is uh, who they uh, prayed in the name of. And now these evil spirits answered back to these seven brothers. And they said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you guys? It's, uh, it's humorous from this end, but it was terrifying uh, in the time that, that it happened. Paul was operating in spiritual authority that was known and recognized in the realm and the regions of darkness. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt upon them, overpowered all seven of these brothers, prevailed against them. They fled out of the house naked and wounded. This one man rises out. I mean, the demons come out and beat up these seven men. Became known to all the Jews and the Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, which was at that time the third largest city of the earth. So a major metropolis, like a a New York City of our day, is what Ephesus was in the days of old. And the fear of God fell upon this major city because of this story. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed uh, uh, came confessing and telling their deeds. And many of those who had practiced magic, they after this testimony... These people who were doing the dark arts brought their magic books, burned them in the sight of everybody, and they counted up the value of all the books that were burned. It totaled 50,000 pieces of silver, a sizable amount of money. Verse 20, And this third largest city of the earth, which New York would be the third largest city of the earth today, the word of God grew mighty, and the word of God prevailed. It conquered a city in the earth. The Word of God did. And what it means by that is that there, there was such power of authority in the preaching and there was such an anointing to confirm the Word that the city was taken captive by the Word of God. Reminds me back in 1857 where they estimated 500,000 converts in the New York City area. 1857, in the Great Revival, Charles Finney was related to uh, that revival. 500,000 converts in eight weeks. 60,000 a week. The Word of God was prevailing in New York City. Doesn't mean that everybody was saved, but it meant that there was an, an unusual breakout of miracles and power in the Word of God. Beloved, that's the vision we have for the city, and that's the vision we have for many cities in the earth. It's not limited to Kansas City. We believe God's going to release, verse 11, unusual miracles by the hands of his servants. We believe that the the, the people are going to have such a life in God, verse 15, they will be known in in hell itself. Their life, their secret life in God and the authority of God that rests upon them will be recognized in hell. One of the great problems of the hour today is, is that a lot of people, their vision stops. It starts and stops with being recognized as having a popular ministry before men. The the great passion of of many of God's servants is to be known on the earth. To have the the, uh, hot ministry, the 
The fiery preaching, the fiery music, the fiery miracles, the fiery this, the fiery that. Paul was known in hell. He had, which means he had an authority that was known in the realm of the angels and of the demons. And these demons, it's not like they're all, that, that, that they're a, a, a omniscient, that they know all things. They told these brothers, we never heard of you guys. We've never trembled at your prayer life or your preaching. We've trembled at the prayer life of this man, Saul of Tarsus, Paul the Apostle. And beloved, that's what's happening right now is that there are people in this room right now that are developing a prayer life in your weakness, but in your persistence and in your continuing in the grace of God, that your your prayer life is such that you're beginning a testimony in God that there will be those of you in this room will, that will be known in hell by the anointing on your life, the dedication of your heart, and the perseverance that you have in the Spirit in prayer. They didn't know Paul because he was famous as a teacher, studied under Gamaliel, Pharisee of Pharisees. They never heard of him in that day. They only knew of Paul because of his life in God. Beloved, I want to have a vision to see something happen in this city that surpasses what happened in Acts 19. I want to have a vision of a community of people who in together, in unity, we are known in hell. And when we preach, when we pray, when we live... It reverberates in the regions of darkness. This is real. This isn't just some uh, kind of a hype testimony. This happened in real time and space with a weak man called Paul. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. There's Romans. Uh, we're, we're in Acts, Romans, 1st and 2 Corinthians. A couple books away. Those of you that are new with your Bibles, 2 Corinthians 12. Verse 9, Paul gives us the pathway to this kind of power. But I, I want to press this point again. It is not enough. It is insufficient. It is sure to distract us to have a vision, to have a popular, well-known ministry. And, and I ask a, a number of you in the room, even now, as I say these words, I, I'm asking you, by the grace of God, to realign your vision even now. And say, Lord, I do want to make an impact, but I want to be known in hell before I want to be known upon the earth. I want to have power that when I speak and pray, angels and demons move because of the authority in my life. Not that crowds will applaud my popular style of preaching or music or worship or whatever that we do in this place. And the Lord's calling us right now to realign, to reshift out of the the common mode of Christian ministries into an apostolic New Testament mindset of having a lifestyle that is recognized by the powers of darkness itself because of the reality of what we have. It's not about somehow working your way up through the ranks in the IHOP world to finally you get to preach at the big conference when it comes and the big worship gathering when it comes. That's not what this thing is about. It's about having something that has power in the realm of the Spirit. That's what we're doing this thing for. And I know that we all know that, but we need to re-sign up for this yet another time. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, Paul gives us the pathway of power. He says he's, he's struggling. Most of you know in verse 7, uh, he's crying out to the Lord. And, and uh, uh, verse 7 and 8, and he's asked three times, Lord, remove the thorn from the flesh. Lord, please remove this burden upon me. And the Lord speaks to him. I'm imagining uh, that the Lord appears to him and directly talks to him face to face. It doesn't say that, but that's how I uh, uh, read this when it says, And he said to me, I believe he stands before Paul and he says, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Here's why my grace is sufficient. Here's the great statement. One of the greatest statements of how to operate in the power of the Spirit. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. It says, The power of God is perfected. The anointing of the Spirit is perfected. Now picture perfected power. What does perfected power look like? What does perfected strength, as the New King James says, other translations call it, power made perfect, perfected power, mature power. Put the word in the anointing. What does the mature or perfected anointing look like? Well, it goes, it's what's happening in the book of Acts and beyond. 
Beloved, I have a vision for the perfection, the, the perfected power, the mature realms of power being released in this place, not just the introductory dimensions of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's an anointing on the new birth. The day you're born again, you can cast out some devils and heal the sick and preach Jesus to your friend within an hour of your conversion and have some power on it because there's an anointing that is automatic on the fact you have the gift of righteousness and you're born again. I don't care how messed up you are. You can have the worst day, the worst week, the worst month, and you're born again. The Word of God is, is, is uh, you, you're using the Word of God. There's an anointing on the Word and just on the born-again experience that is an introductory anointing that happens. That's why people have the most messed up lives, and they still lay hands on the sick, and the sick still get healed. People said, how's that? The Lord says, well, there's, a, there's an automatic anointing that's, inter- that's part of the introduction of grace. So when you're having a bad day, don't bow out of the prayer line thinking that your good day makes your prayer life uh, good and your bad day makes it bad. Now, there's an anointing that operates no matter what. It's really true. It's free to everyone in the kingdom of God. So don't, don't have confidence when you have a good day and lose your confidence when you have a bad day. Some of, my, uh, some of the greatest things the Lord's done in my life, which aren't that great, but uh, some of the, the things that have happened in my life have happened when I was in the worst uh, 24, 36 hour bad mood, just, just things not going well. And I mean, I don't mean just circumstances, the car broke. I mean, I was in a, ba- I wasn't happy with my disposition. Let's put it that way internally. And the Lord used me and I said, you know, what meaneth thou this? How's this happened? And the Lord's answer is, there's an anointing on just the fact you're using the word and you're born again and you can, you can have confidence in that. It's because of my heart for you. So, but I'm, I'm not talking about a good days and bad days or a good month or a bad month. I'm talking about a lifestyle where we are contending to enter into a new realm of authority. I mean a new realm of authority. Far beyond the introductory realm that is guaranteed to every believer that wants it. That's why some of these, so many of these churches that don't uh, believe in the power of God for, is for today, they go to a seminar one weekend, and that week healings start breaking out, and they go, my goodness, it's happening. It's always been available. If they start Monday, it's happening by Sunday. It really, really is. It, it really will happen. Just It's just that easy. We can bring our interns in. Maybe they've never seen it before. By the end of the week, they'll. it's very, very likely one or two people will be touched or healed, or they might prophesy, and they go, ah. It's within the reach of everybody right now. It really is. Every born-again believer. But that's not what I'm content with. I'm grateful for that. I really am. I mean, without that, where would we be? But I said, Lord, I have a vision for something else. It's called power made perfect. Perfected power. I want to see unusual miracles. Acts 19, verse 11. I want to see demons moving back through the prayers that are coming back from this place. I believe it's happening in a measure, but nothing compared to where God wants to release authority in this place. But he wants us to move into his heart in an abandonment. Because there's a difference between the introductory uh, grace of God, the introductory anointing that's guaranteed at salvation, and the greater realms that God gives those who take the kingdom by force, who press into his heart with a vision for the fullness of God's power. That takes a intentional determination, a fierce determination to enter into a new realm of power, not just the introductory realm. And beloved, I love the introductory realm. But the Lord tells Paul, there's a realm called perfected power, and it, it's entered into by weakness. Now, the weakness in this context is not sinfulness. It's not saying if you sin more, you get more power. That's not what it's talking about here. Now, Romans 5, verse 20 says that when you sin more, God gives you more grace because more grace is needed to forgive you. But this is a different concept. A concept. He's talking about the embracing of weakness. And the weakness that Paul is is embracing in 2 Corinthians 11 and 12 is what it's talking about. Just read the the context. It's a lifestyle of fasting, prayer, giving financially, serving, and bearing bearing up under persecution uh, by blessing. He blessed his enemies when he was mistreated. So uh, the weakness that, that the Lord is speaking about is this voluntary weakness that is, that is uh, the voluntary weakness is what you're embracing when you uh, uh, walk in fasting and prayer. I mean, think about this for a moment. The Lord says, if you talk to me instead of go out there without talking to me, you're investing your time and your energy to an invisible God, 
You are losing valuable time and energy to go build things. That when you invest your time and energy, that's what prayer is about, investing your time and energy, your, your strength and your energy to the invisible God, you could be out using your time and energy building something, and you're, you're drawing back from building in that time frame, using that time and energy to press into prayer, talking to the invisible God. That is called weakness. You are embracing a lifestyle of weakness before God, Prayer is an extension of living in voluntary weakness. We say, Lord, I believe that giving up my productivity out there to touch you actually releases more power, and it takes faith to do it. Being in the prayer room is not just an issue of dedication. It's an issue of faith. It's more than just, I love God, so I'll be in the prayer room. The other guy says, well, I love God. That's why I'm out there touching people. Of course, we know that the biblical balance is that we connect an encounter with God in the place of prayer, and then in the overflow, we go touch people. We know that history says we skip the encounter with God, and we just reach people, touch them, and the touching of people is significantly less effective that way. It's still a little bit effective because there's an anointing on the new birth. There's an anointing on the Word that's guaranteed. It's it's automatic. So we're not choosing between prayer and touching people. We're putting it in its priority But when you live in prayer, it's more than dedication. It's a statement of faith, of confidence, that talking to the invisible God, because it's God's economy to do this, it's His will, actually releases more power than doing the work without talking to Him. It's a statement of faith. Fasting is the same way. The Lord says, I will do more if you fast. Now, fasting is is about weakness. You're giving your physical strength... You're giving it away in fasting. Fasting is a deliberate embracing of weakness. Giving your money is the identical same thing. Your money is power. When you give your money away, you're giving your power, your life power away. Part of the resource of your life. You sow it into the kingdom of God in obedience to the invisible God. That is an act of weakness when you do that. Persecution is the same thing. Bearing up under persecution. Instead of getting your own vengeance, striking back, slandering, dividing. We silently bear under it, rejoicing in the Lord, trusting the Lord. That is an act of weakness to do that. Now, here's the point. The Lord's standing before Paul, and he says, Paul, you want more power. You continue embracing weakness. Weakness is the pathway to power. And again, not human failure, The lifestyle of voluntary weakness. The Lord makes that clear right through the Bible. Genesis to Revelation. The way into power is voluntarily laying hold of a lifestyle of weakness related to fasting, prayer, giving, and being persecuted. Those are the four main ways of which weakness is described in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 12 and the whole Word of God. Now, we often talk about fasting, prayer, giving, and, uh, and uh, uh, bearing persecution as statements of dedication. And they are statements of dedication. But more than, not more than that, in addition to that, they are statements of confidence that God's way is the way of power. And here's the problem, is that when we fast and pray, the power doesn't break out immediately. There's a time delay, and the Lord tests our faith. And when the time delay, some time goes by, sometimes a long period of time, we want to draw back from fasting and prayer. The Lord says, so you think that I'm telling a lie, that that's the way to power, don't you? You think the way to power is to, is to skip that step and do it on your own, don't you? And most ministries right through history, all through human, all through church history, end up believing the lie there's more power by spending your time by doing the stuff, by more of your time doing the stuff, instead of taking some of that time and pouring it into the presence of God. And they're measuring in the immediate, in the here and now. But you take the uh, big picture step back of, of church history, when there's been persistent fasting and prayer and faithfulness and giving and the bearing of the stigma of the anointing, the reproach and the stigma of the anointing, there may be five or ten or twenty years go by, but history says this always Always God proves himself true that he releases power in a greater dimension in response to voluntary weakness. Always. 
Now, some people do it for one month or two months or three months. Some even go as far to one or two years. And if they don't see measurable increase of power, which often they, they do it to some degree, but if they don't see a measurable increase of power, they sell out, they trade in, if you will, this divine principle. They say, God, we know your word says it. I don't buy it. I'm going to go pursue power my own way and be content with the introductory anointing that's guaranteed to everybody the first day they're born again. Beloved, in this house, at the very foundation of this house, we believe that voluntary weakness, fasting, prayer, giving, and bearing the stigma and the reproach of the anointing with the counterattack and all that's involved with Satan's counterattack, etc., we believe that is the only way to the full dimensions of God's power. And though we may wait five years, we may wait ten years, this we are sure of. God will not lie. He cannot lie. And history bears witness that those that embrace God's way end up in the power of God far beyond what they would have if they give up and begin to do it man's way. And man's way is just to do the kingdom by bypassing, skipping the step of weakness. The message of weakness It's an offensive message in the church. It's an invasive message. Invasive. It moves in. It gets real close to us. I don't want to spend my good hours in prayer. I would rather spend my good hours out doing it. And the Lord says, I want you to spend your good hours doing it, but not all of them. I want some of your good hours connecting with me. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't measure good. I don't want to fast. I don't want to give. And I don't want to bear the stigma and the reproach of being, of, of the anointing. And beloved, there's a very serious stigma in the anointing. So, many, many of God's servants draw back. We don't like that part of the Word of God. Look at that church down the road. They're growing. I'm going to go do it that way and skip God's way. Well, five years turns to ten. Ten turns to twenty. Twenty turns to fifty. And uh, the water level more times than not, stays about one inch deep in the Spirit. Beloved, I am not content for the water level and the Holy Spirit to be one inch deep. We want water level that's going above above and beyond. But there is a clear pathway, and it takes faith. Faith means confidence that our investment of weakness... I mean, here we are where many times it doesn't matter if the prayer is anointed. It really doesn't. Here we are praying, and our words feel like they're just hitting the ground, and we're dead... We're tired and we're fasting and we're like, and we've given our money. We have none. And people think we're off the wall and we're a cult and, and we're uh, 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 treating the Word of God wrong and we're dangerous to the body of Christ. Our body's tired and they're doing the night watch or the day watch or whatever. And they're going, what is the deal? The Lord says, do you believe this is the way to the greater realms of power described by my Word because I declared it? And we say, well, I haven't been doing it a couple of years. I haven't seen it. The Lord says, a couple of years. That's not long enough to sell out my word. Not a couple of years. Beloved history, I'd love to give you a, a history lesson, and I, I'm sure I'll throw in examples here and there uh, over, the, over in the future. But the, the stories of, of a Herrenhut in Germany, 120-year prayer meeting. Of Bangor, Ireland, 300 years of night and day prayer, the greatest prayer ministry in history. Cornelius spent his entire life in fasting and prayer and giving alms, and then suddenly the angels come. In Acts chapter 10, this, this man spent many years. Imagine the prayer meeting of Cornelius. Here he is, an unsaved Gentile, doesn't even go to the synagogue. He's got four people, no born-again experience, no anointing, no anointed worship tapes, no nothing, just, just roll him with four people, no anointing, no born-again experience, no instruments. Here's pr- day after day after day. One year turns to ten, ten turns to twenty, twenty turns to thirty. Suddenly, the angel of God appears. He says, you're the family, you're the man that's going to open up the word of God to all the Gentile nations. And he thought, I didn't think anybody was listening up there after all these years. It was, Acts 10 was the shock of his life when that angel appeared and says, your prayers and your giving are a memorial in the presence of God himself. They are like a, 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 well, a memorial. It's what it is. It's like a, uh, it's what a memorial is. In the presence of God, a living witness in God's throne. And Cornelius is talking to this angel in Acts 10, undoubtedly, thinking, 
No, no, it can't be right. I was there at that prayer meeting. There's only four of us for like 25 years. No anointing, no power, no music, no nothing. And you're telling me that it's a living witness in heaven right now, and you're going to open up the nations of the earth through my family, the gospel to the nations of the earth? And the angel says, yes, that's what I'm telling you. Beloved, we measure it all wrong. We measure it in three months or three years. This man was precedent 10, 20, 30 years, probably closer to 20, 30. Anna, 60 years, Acts 2, verse 37, 60 years. We're not talking about... We're not talking about she did her six prayer meetings a week for two hours. We're talking about a woman night and day for 60 years, hours, hours a day. And at the back end of her prayer, there's a young baby called John, the name John the Baptist, a forerunner, and another young baby called Jesus coming forth in the fruit of her prayers. This little gal in the temple with a couple of her friends, 10 years turns to 20, 20 turns to 30. She's there 7, 8, 9 hours a day, 5, 6, 7 days a week, 10, 20, 30, 5 or 6 people there. Nothing is happening but the greatest forerunner, the greatest man born of a woman is on the back end of those prayers. John the Baptist, she's laboring. And then the God-man himself is coming after that just 6 months later. Jesus would tell them in John chapter 4, the apostles, he says, you're entering into the labors of others. Others have labored. You're going to enter the harvest. Undoubtedly, he had Anna in his mind. Here are the 12 apostles are preaching and power is breaking out. They have entered into the labors of Anna and her company that for 60 years labored in the temple. Again, Heronhood, 120 years, the first great Protestant mission movement. Bangor, Ireland, 300 years, starting in 555 A.D., the great... A uh, uh, movement broke out in Europe. Beloved, prayer and fasting, it's called weakness. If we have confidence that the Word of God is true, we will not just do this as an act of devotion. That's fantastic. We'll never outdo that. Devotion as an act of commitment and love. That is Christianity 101. But it's more than love. It is a statement that I am investing my time, my energy, my physical strength, my, my body's tired from just the hours. My body's tired from the fasting. My pocketbook is empty from the giving. People all over saying this, that, and the other. And I say, Lord, I believe there is no improvement on your revelation of the way to power. There is only one way to power, and I believe it. It's a statement of faith, and we're all buying into this statement of faith. Yes, it's a statement of devotion, but it's a statement of faith. Hebrews 6.12 says this. Hebrews 6.12 says, You will inherit the promises through faith and patience. Patience. We're measuring. We're, we're, uh, we're so easily caught into measuring in the wrong time frame. We're measuring in the immediate. We're pressing in one month, three months, three years. We don't see it. The Lord says, there is going to come something out of the out of the womb of this IHOP that is going to shake the nations of the earth. It may be 5, 10, 20 years away. It doesn't matter the timing because the timing is perfect. This, I promise you, you cannot embrace weakness day in and day out without God answering in fire and power. And he's spoken audibly from heaven. I have called you to do this thing. This, this is a, a summary of a couple words. In order to be a force that see not the only force, to see the understanding in Christianity in the whole earth changed in one generation. Beloved, this is truly going to happen. This is what we're, th- we're about. 